Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about horses. But first, a couple of new patrons to say thank you to. So welcome back and thank you again to Nick Batter. Thank you to Zirafa and to Guille Puerto, if that's even close to the right pronunciation. <laughs> thank you so much. Also, thank you to Daryl Hoppersberger. Now, you asked me if I knew anything about the etymology of your names. And as to your last name, I think your, your guess is as, as good as anything. I think you're right. The Berger part probably has something to do with a mountain or a hill or something. So it's probably the name. It's a place name. Probably right, comes right. from. I think we should just decree that it means mountain of hops. <laughs> mountain of hops. Yeah. As you say. So let's go with that. But as for the first name, I did find something about that. So apparently it can be both a male or female name in English speaking places, but in Spanish speaking places, it's strictly masculine. This is the name Dariel. Dariel. didn't hear it first of all. And so for men, the assumption is that it comes just as a, a combination of, you know, one of the various names that start with Dare, like Darren or something like that, Darren, Dario. And the sort of standard ending in a lot of biblical names, El, like Daniel and Gabriel. Which means of El, mm -hmm. right, of God. But for women, the first use of this name might be traced back to a particular source, a novel called Dariel, A Romance of Surrey, published in 1897, written by the English author R.D. Blackmore, in which Dariel is the name of a Caucasian princess. Now, the author of this novel might have derived it from the name Tariel, which is a masculine name in that region in Georgia and you know, that, that region in the Caucasus Mountains. In the Caucasus Mountains. So, you know, it became at least popular from that. And that's about all we can find, uh, yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for your support. Indeed. If anyone else wants to support us on Patreon, please head on over. And if you want to ask us to find out some more about your names, I don't know that we were going to make it into a side business exactly, but I think, <laughs> I think for new patrons, we're happy to do so if we can help out. <laughs> So today we're going to be featuring an interview all about horses in the ancient world. Not about words for horses. Maybe we'll do another episode about that because there are actually lots of things to say about that. But this is more about the use of the horse in antiquity. And we interviewed Carolyn Willicus. She holds degrees in classical studies from the University of Calgary and the University of Guelph and teaches at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And her main area of interest, as you'll hear, is horses in antiquity. And she's published two books, as well as multiple articles, The Horse in the Ancient World, From Bucephalus to the Hippodrome, in 2016, and Greek Warriors, Hoplites and Heroes, in 2017. So get set for some great stories and fascinating equine facts. Giddy up. So, Carolyn, we have a question that we used to always ask our interviewees. We don't do it all the time anymore, but it just seems to me that you're the perfect person for this question. <laughs> Tell me about the ways in which your professional life and other aspects of your life have become surprisingly connected. Yeah, that's a great question because I basically have no separation between my professional <laughs> life and my personal non-professional life because everything that I do with my research and the things I teach are basically exactly the same things I do in my, my quote unquote downtime. So horses have been a huge part of my life for going on 30 plus years now, long before I even knew what classic ancient history or grad school was. I was a wee little person, eight or 10 years old. So yeah, I fell in love with horses as a child, as so many of us do. We get the horse curse, obsession with horses. And I didn't outgrow it much to, I think, my parents. I didn't hit that like teenage phase where I'm like, oh, I don't need horses anymore. Uh, I just kept going with them. So yeah, I started riding as a kid, just, you know, English riding lessons, typical package type stuff, hunters, jumpers, all of that. Obsessed with all things horses, read every book I could about, about, about horses, fiction, nonfiction, you name it, I was devouring them. But when it came to school, when it came to university, it, it never really crossed my mind that this was something I could study because I didn't go into a bio side related field. I mean, I started off in anthropology and then switched into classics. And so I was like, yeah, I mean, 
the Greeks had horses and the Romans had horses and they seemed to like putting horses on things. But I didn't connect the dots that I could study horses in the Greek and Roman worlds and other parts of the ancient world uh, until I started my master's degree. And so I moved across the country, moved from Ontario to, to Alberta and um, was starting my master's at the University of Calgary, was going to study Alexander. My big plan was to study his deification and religious propaganda and that whole thing. So I'd done my undergrad thesis on that. And my grad supervisor, doctor, was like, no, no, you can't. Not that one. No, I don't like that topic. It's like, but he was on my application. I just moved across the country. What, what am I supposed to do now? I need to study something. And so his suggestion, he's like, well, you ride horses. So why don't you study cavalry? Because I know nothing about warfare. Even, like, I, I don't like violence. I've, I've never thought about warfare other than like high school history classes before in my life. And he gave me a book to read on ancient cavalry. It was a recent publication at the time, and it was pretty good, but it just raised all sorts of questions. The biggest one being who in their right mind thought it was a good idea to actually use horses in war because they're afraid of everything. <laughs> so I kind of fell into this seemingly never ending rabbit hole of ancient horses. How do you train them? What do they look like? How are they bred? What were their specific characteristics? How did it vary from region to region? Did they have specialized breeding and things like that? And so I then started training war horses to figure out how it all actually worked. Then I started traveling around the world to, to ride horses in different parts of the ancient world to see what these sort of local breeds or types I don't like the term breed, types were like and how they were suited to the environment. And uh, yeah, the two just became one. My professional life <laughs> and my hobby, personal fun life kind of collided. And I feel like they shall never separate again. <laughs> <laughs> right. So unexpected, but now uh, lifelong. <laughs> it's one of those really fortuitous. I don't think, I mean, there's no way I could have planned it like this, like at mm. all. It, it wouldn't have worked, I think, if I'd planned it with like, yes, I'd go here and study horses and train horses and feel like that would have imploded. So it's been this kind of bumbling along, almost serendipitous finding of a path in which I've been very, very mm. lucky in doing what I love. I mean, I love studying the ancient world and the culture and the material culture and all of that. And obviously I love horses and they've somehow just mashed themselves together. And it gives you a, a really special position that another scholar who studies horses might not have is that you have so much experience on the practical side. Like you can do things like experimental archaeology. You can go out into the world and look at horse traditions that, that are around today that someone who is just reading about wouldn't have that kind of insight or ability to engage with the topic. Yeah, I mean, for sure. That's a huge advantage. And colleagues I know who, again, study horses in later time periods, Middle Ages or early modern period or modern period, again, they often tend to come from an equestrian background because when studying horses, there's a whole language that goes with it. I mean, there's this whole jargon. There's always been a jargon, whether you're looking at ancient Greek or like, not that I know Syrian, but I'm presuming they had their own jargon <laughs> or Latin or old English or anything like that. There is a language that we use to discuss horses and describe horses and talk about the things that we train them to do and different maneuvers and the equipment and all of that. And often there are, especially when talking about the behavior of the animal, just so important in training them and understanding how they're used, there are these like sort of nuanced phrases that, yes, you could translate them literally, but unless you understand what that phrase is referring to in terms of the animal and how it might react to something or their thought process or something like that, it's not really going to make sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the fact that I've spent so much time with horses and have kind of dedicated my life to riding them, training them, understanding every aspect of their existence means that you can pick up on those subtleties for, for sure, which is a huge advantage. Because sometimes you'll read, you know, like Xenophon's Art of Horsemanship, and if you didn't understand what he was talking about on like an intrinsic level, you're like, this sounds odd. He's talking mm -hmm. about different types of bits or different um, training patterns you can ride to make your horse supple on both sides. And without that firsthand experience of because horses are naturally stiffer on one side than the other, just like we have a dominant side and a less dominant side, you're not necessarily going to find the, the usefulness uh, in mm -hmm. that statement. Yeah, there's a lot of implied and implicit knowledge that even a manual of horse training is not going to bother to tell you. They're going to assume you've stood next to a horse before. So, you know, they're not going to give you the really, really basic stuff. It reminds me of when I, as a Latin poetry person, work on the eclogues. And while I don't think that Virgil was all that big a farmer himself, nonetheless, in the ancient world, there was a lot more closeness to 
animals and basic understanding and the many words for types of sheep and cows and different ages and used, yes, just for poetic use, but also to an audience that would know what the heck they meant. And my complete lack of agricultural knowledge on herding means that you have to go and look in a dictionary and find, oh, well, what is the difference? What does it matter if it's a two-year-old or three-year-old sheep? Why should I care about that? And I'm sure I miss a whole bunch of stuff because I don't have that knowledge. And I don't even know what to look for. And that's, I think, often true when you talk about specialized stuff. You don't even know which holes you have in your knowledge and how to plug those holes. For sure. I mean, when I'm reading modern research secondary sources on cavalry, Mm -hmm. ancient cavalry, you can always tell if the author has experience with horses or not. Because if they do... Mm -hmm that kind of creeps in. If they don't, they basically describe the horses as almost being like tanks. Like they assume that all horses are this homogenous thing and they all act exactly the same way. And you have your tactics and you put them in drive and off you go into battle and it's just going to Mm -hmm. magically work, which of course is not how it works. Whereas people who have that experience with horses are like, yeah, you may be aware of this and this tactic, it it works. This was the plan, but this is how it actually probably turned out and <laughs> here are some surprises that could pop up and and as you were saying like Virgil yeah probably not farmer of the year but obviously mm-hmm. aware of farming jargon and, and, and vernacular and you see the same thing with the sources and, and references to horses where they appear in everything they're in every genre of, of literature and again whether you're looking at erotic poetry or epic poetry or historical account of Thucydides and, and, and things like that and Arian and stuff When they mention horses, the authors, and again, it's probably because they are coming from the upper classes, so they would have familiarity with horses because it's their class privilege. Mm -hmm. Their sort of almost innate or expected understanding still comes through in their writing. So even when they're not trying to write Mm -hmm. a text on horses, their understanding of what a horse is and its basic requirements still come through. I mean, Thucydides talks about the Athenian cavalry. And they're riding out, riding out every day to Attica to try and keep the Spartans from ravaging the crops and all of that. But it's hot and it's dry. And so because they're riding out day after day, their horses start to go lame from the rocky ground. And Thucydides puts that in there. And it's like, well, of course they would, because it's a repetitive injury. They're bruising their feet. They didn't have horseshoes yet. And it's those little things that I always find so fascinating. Those side references that show this understanding so clearly. And again, it's interesting that for previous generations of classicists or people working with these texts up to, say, the end of the 19th century, given that they would have been upper class people as well, they would have lived with horses. Again, even if they weren't experts, everyone pretty much was riding around, there were horses around them, whether they were riding or not, there were horses that they lived cheek by jowl with. And so everybody who was engaging with those texts, whether or not they realized they had that expertise, had you know, a, a similar level, at least, of base knowledge. It's only within the 20th century that that has become so specialized and so uncommon among people who are taking an intellectual path rather than other types of, of approaches and become, you know, horses become even more rarefied in terms of elite. Really, there aren't that many people who get the chance to ride horses. You don't have to be elite to do it. I, I rode horses as a kid too, but, you know, I'm a solidly middle-class family. We had that access, didn't own a horse, but got to ride them. And so it's, that has become a much less common base level of expertise. You have much more than just basic familiarity, but up till fairly recently, it wouldn't have been a big gap, just like the agricultural knowledge wasn't a huge gap for somebody in the 17th, 18th century reading Virgil. And we've lost a lot of that familiarity. So we have to come back to it through expertise rather than daily knowledge. Yeah, that was actually a thingy way, way back, yonks and yonks, when I was defending my master's. And that was a question I was asked by someone on my committee. Mm -hmm. Because so many of the translations, most, the majority of translations we have of Xenophon's Art of Horsemanship are older. Like the Loeb one, I think is from like 1922. And then there's another one by the publishing house J.A. Allen. They do a lot of equestrian publications. It's from like the late 1800s. And normally that, you know, puts a red flag for us. Like, hey, this is a really old translation. There's probably going to be cultural bias, eliteness, Mm -hmm. that whole thing. When sometimes they're funny about translating certain words because it was seen as inappropriate (laughs) and and all of that. But with Mm -hmm. these texts, it is almost an advantage because, as you pointed out, doing these translations of Xenophon from Greek into English in the 1800s and 1900s, Again, educated, elite, upper class individuals who most likely, even if they didn't ride all of the time, that would have been part of their social Mm -hmm. existence would be the ability to sit on a horse, maybe go hunting, maybe go to the races, Mm -hmm. play polo, things like that. So it is kind of a 
like with the agricultural texts, an interesting reversal from how we often look at translations today. It's like, no, we need to mm -hmm. update our translations and modernize them or look at them through different lenses. Whereas with these, we're like, no, these are actually really good translations because <laughs> the horse was still such an important part of that society. So what do you want to give us as much of a capsule history as you can of your research interests? So you started off by looking at the horse in the ancient world, but I imagine it was a little more specific than that. Um, and what have been the sort of main kind of research areas you've looked at and some of the things you've worked on and are working on now? So the starting point was the war horse, not so much the military strategy side of it. I mean, I talk about tactics and formations and all. I mean, you have to when you look at military mm -hmm. history, but that's not my favorite part. I do that because I have to. All of my military history friends are going to be cringing right now. But what I've been <laughs> absolutely fascinated and I guess borderline fixated or obsessed with is how we actually did it, right? How do you train a war horse? Because it makes, like I said, it makes zero sense. This is a, mm -hmm. a highly attuned flight animal that runs away from everything. It runs away from its own shadow. It runs away from its farts. It runs away from a plastic bag. <laughs> Not that they had those in antiquity, but it would probably spook it at amphora that it didn't think was there before. Because this is how the species evolved to survive in the wild, was to run away mm -hmm. from any potential dangers without giving it a really long think ahead of time. They just run. And so when we ride a horse to war, we're asking them to completely override that evolutionary instinct. Because you know, I always picture it, and this is how I often describe when I'm teaching elementary school classes on on sort of, you know, the history of horses and, and stuff like that. Is you were on this horse and you're riding off and you line up for battle and you look across at your opponents who all have these sharp pointy things pointed directly at you. And your horse is probably like, yeah, okay, we see them. So we're going to, we've seen them. So we're going to turn around and go in the safe direction now. We're like, no, it's fine. I got you. Trust me. We're just going to go gallop into them. Just, just go into the sharp pointy things. What's the worst that could happen? It's fine. And when you put it that way, it does sound utterly absurd, yet clearly it worked because the horse revolutionized warfare. The horse was a central component of warfare for thousands of years. Not having cavalry often puts you at a disadvantage. So as the horse and mounted chariot warfare, but especially mounted warfare spread initially across Eurasia and, and North Africa, but then, you know, through colonization, colonialism, trade, and all of that stuff to other parts of the world, it becomes a necessary component. So obviously mm -hmm. trading war horses worked, this whole phenomenon worked. So I wanted to figure out how you did it. And I was very fortunate to be given access to a herd of war horses. They're predominantly jousting horses outside of Calgary. It's the Society of Tilt and Lance Cavalry. And so I started going out there and experimenting. And at first I was like, I, I don't know. I'm just going to trial and error, figure out how it worked. And, and then obviously had to add in the armor and the weaponry and see how does this adjust the way you ride. Because then it went from how do you train the horses to why did they sometimes do things in a manner that's different from how we would do it today in the 21st century, right? Why do they sometimes have different riding styles? Mm. Why did they, the way they sit the horse or the way they control the horse? Why did they have big massive bits or big spurs? I mean, I thought the Greeks did, but later cultures had big spurs. Greeks had little spurs. Mm. What's the reason for all of this? Because so often I think there is this unfortunate tendency to go, well, they didn't understand or they were ignorant or they were doing it wrong or they were abusive, whatever, rather than, OK, well, there's probably a reason why they're doing it this way, because because it's not like it was a random one off and someone happened to make a relief of it. They kept doing this over and over again. So often when you sort of scratch below the surface a little bit, you find logical explanations. And then from there, mm -hmm. it snowballed into well, what did their horses look like? We have an idea of what their horses look like from the art, but the art is a bit of an idealization. So what did ancient horse types look like? And to discover that, I was visiting my parents back in Ontario, and I had this old encyclopedia of the horse with all the pretty glossy photographs of different horse you know, breeds or types in it. And I'm skimming through, and I was like, oh my god, there's a page of Greek horses. Who knew? <laughs> and so these two Greek breeds, the <laughs> Pindos pony and the Skiros pony, and I was looking at the Pindos pony, and I looked at it, and then like, I looked at a picture of the Parth like a, a, a section of the Parthenon uh, relief, and then back, and then I'm like, it looks like the same animal. I mean, of course it looks like the same. It's the same mm. environment. Same environment, same food, same conditions. And so that triggered what has 
been a really special part of my research, which is traveling to different parts of the ancient world to actually ride these horses, which is not to say that a modern Greek pony or a modern Mongolian horse is identical to one from 2000 years ago, but there's an environmental continuity that certainly exists. So that's kind of taken the experimental side to a whole other level that has been really cool. Challenging at times, very challenging at times, but probably the coolest part of the research that I get to do. So I, I've been recently doing a bit of research on Proto-Indo-European and the spread of Proto-Indo-European, and it becomes pretty immediately clear that it's very entwined with the spread of horse technology, of the ability to ride horses. And I was wondering, how much do we know about the genetic spread of horses? Like, are they taking breeds from, you know, the steppes area, or are they training local horses? How does that spread happen? So that is a, that is a can of worms, but I shall <laughs> do, do my best. Ask yeah. easy questions. So there is more and more, obviously, as the technology that we have access to advances, there's more and more research being done on testing DNA from ancient horse remains to try and answer those questions, try and figure out, you know, where was the horse domesticated? How did these populations migrate? Most equine historians and archaeologists, I think, would be fairly comfortable in saying that that by the time the horse was domesticated, roughly five and a half ish thousand years ago, is kind of the general date that a lot of people play with. There were not a lot of horses left, so horses. Pretty much, I mean, they had been long extinct in North, South, Central America. So our side of the world seemed to have gone extinct here sort of around 10,000 BCE. And so they only really existed in pockets of Eurasia. Where exactly those pockets were, some people say maybe some in, in the British Isles, in sort of Northern Iberia, definitely Central Asia, whether there are any down in the Northern parts of the Middle East, we're not sure. But there weren't a lot of populations. So it's not like if you were in Greece or uh, Turkey, or Russia or something, you necessarily had these herds of, of wild horses just wandering along. They were in very sort of specific spots. And so after they're domesticated, and again, a lot of the evidence suggests to domestication coming out of Central Asia, there's a really important site in Kaz that provides some reasonably firm evidence for this, that the horse then began to spread with the people who had domesticated it. Because again, you know, when we I mean, a horse seemed to have been domesticated as a food source, but then you realize, hey, we can also ride them, which was pretty sort of probably mind blowing because prior to that, <laughs> if you wanted to go anywhere, you walked or you had your ox cart or you had your donkey, which while they're strong and durable, they're not the fastest sort of <laughs> mode of transportation. So the horse, I often liken the horse to like, now I've got a sports car. I've got this Ferrari. And when you prance into town on a horse, even though they're small horses, you're going to be noticed and it adds to sort of your presence. And so Horses and the technology and the language that's developed to describe them, you know, it then gradually starts to spread, right? I mean, with trade, with sort of diplomatic relations, we know that by the Bronze Age, horses are being shipped around the Mediterranean as diplomatic gifts, you know, from the Hittites to the Egyptians and so on and so forth. So they gradually spread through trade, through warfare, through diplomacy, people moving about, and then the language and the technology comes with them. Right. So maybe not only one population as an original population, but probably mostly coming from one sort of domestication act over some period of time that moves outward rather than multiple sort of re-domestications in multiple places. Yeah. I mean, when probably. horses arrived, like when they arrived in Mesopotamia, which is probably one of the first mm -hmm. places they did migrate down to with people after domestication, I think it was, was it Sumeria? I can't remember the exact language, but one of the you know, one of the linguistic groups, they had to think of how to describe this animal because they hadn't seen right. it before. And so they called it the ass of the mountain because it came over the mountains and, and down into Mesopotamia. And it was the same thing when horses then came across the Atlantic with the, the colonizers and settlers and conquistadors and all of that. You know, the indigenous tribes, First Nations tribes, again, they there was nothing here that was rideable. I mean, if transport mm -hmm. animals, you had dogs. And then if you went south, you had llamas and alpacas for carrying your things, but you weren't riding them. Mm -hmm. And so again, they were trying to come up with a, a description for this new animal. And so they were called big dog or sky dog or big elk, because they were trying mm -hmm. to build that association with an animal they were familiar with. I mean, a horse doesn't look like a dog, but it's useful like a dog. A horse kind of looks like an elk. So let's sort of mm -hmm. give it that name. So you can often use language to trace domestication and trace the arrival of 
I suppose, foreign animals or exotic animals into a new region because they have to come up with a way of talking about them and recording what they are and naming them. And you can also use the North American and South American examples as also a model for the likelihood that, as you say, horses pro- may very well have um, moved far ahead of the people who rode the horses because of trade, because, you know, the horses made it to the plains and the indigenous people in the plains long before people made it. Western settlers made it there by the time they, because of trade, trade networks and everything, by the time yeah, exactly. there were in, in any intensive settlement in that area of people bringing their own horses, the horses were already there. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. And it's Mediterranean too. Yeah. And it's one of the things that's so fascinating about this animal, I mean, even going far beyond the ancient world and into sort of the, the 19th and 20th centuries and stuff, you know, is again, as you see people colonizing, taking control, dominating, whatever, different parts of the world and bringing their presence there they would bring horses. And so the indigenous communities would see this animal and almost always incorporate it with into their own traditions in some way, right? They develop their own equestrian sports. They develop their own equipment. They work it into sort of folklore and storytelling, which I think really speaks to just the presence of horses and, and the usefulness of horses. Mm-hmm. I think the only other animal that we could probably, you know, in sort of a as a not food animal that we could look at in a comparative sense would probably be dogs, right? I mean, as an animal mm-hmm. that isn't primarily used for secondary resources, right? That we're using for companionship or to do jobs. Horses and dogs kind of had this spread across different regions and, and work themselves into communities and cultures and identities in a very interesting way. So let's get back to some of this uh, more experimental archaeology, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> Because it's just so fascinating what you've had a chance to do, what you've been able to do, and what you've done with it. So you said that you've done, one of the things you've been doing is going to places and riding sort of native horses or horses that that seem like they might be connected to the ancient lines. Do you want to tell us a bit about some of those experiences? Sure. So the first one was Greece, which seemed like a logical starting point. I was was back, (laughs) I don't know, I think it was a couple years into my PhD at this point in time. And uh, I was TAing a, a field school over there in between the fall and and winter semesters we took some grad students some other grad students and and some undergrads over and i decided to stay on for a few weeks after because i wasn't ta or anything so a winter course so i didn't have to rush back and i was on crete and so ahead of time i had sort of googled (laughs) riding in greece as you do (laughs) and found this fantastic place and so spent you know several days uh, with them sort of just exploring uh, the areas outside of Heraklion and it was really cool because they had some they had some North African horses they had some of the different Greek horses so those from sort of central mainland Greece but they also had uh, a Cretan type of horse called the Yorkalidiko which means the fast walker and it uh, it's a gated horse it tolts like the Icelandic horses and I got to ride one of those which was really cool because I'd never ridden a fully gated horse before and it's just the most comfortable thing Thing to sit on and she was like a little mountain goat like again you can see how she's <laughs> adapted to this because she's just picking her way up and down these super narrow rocky passes and you know up and down all sorts of crazy terrain without batting an eyelash or stumbling or anything look at her you're like she looks really tiny and super narrow and i feel like i'm gonna tip her over when i get on but once you're on her <laughs> she's like no i'm like she's like an all-terrain vehicle like i am perfectly adapted to this environment So that was really cool. It was also really interesting because islands are curious environments for horses, especially, I mean, Crete is not a small island, but it's a pretty rocky island. And so, yes, they have horses on Crete. Yes, they have their Cretan type, their local horse, but a lot of people don't use them anymore. They're kind of just there in the background, sort of kept for ceremonial purposes or sporting purposes. And so people were quite terrified of the horses. It was olive harvesting season and and we were riding through the olive groves and like the dogs would hide under the trucks. People would like step out of the way and jump behind (laughs) the olive trees as myself and my host were like, just like the two of us. And and we weren't on demon horses. Like we're just walking our way up through the (laughs) olive groves, not charging like a bat out of hell. And people were like, Ooh, 
and even resources, right? Again, thinking back to the mm-hmm. ancient world and, you know, the need to feed these horses and provide for these horses. When you're on these really rocky islands, pretty much everything has to be brought in, right? You have to import food, which makes them even more expensive and, and more difficult to keep. And to see that in the 21st century, where it's like, yeah, it's 21st century. Yes, you know, we can, we have our grain and we have all this and all that, but basically everything they had for their horses had to be imported either from mainland Greece or brought down from Northern Europe. So that was kind of really cool to see that connection or to make that connection between kind of island horse hypotrophia in the modern world and and thinking back to how that would have worked in the ancient world as well. I've ridden in Turkey a few times, which was also super cool. It was a new sort of hiking riding trail that they were setting up called the Avlia Celebi route. So Avlia Celebi was an Ottoman explorer. He wrote a book about his travels around the Ottoman Empire. And so it was riding part of his route through Turkey. And to this day, I, st- I still don't know what I wrote on my little bio because, you know, okay, they're like, tell us about yourself and your riding experience because they want to match you up with, with the horses. So I have no idea what I wrote, but we get there and, you know, take the ferry and go to where the horses are waiting where we're going to pick them up. And everyone else is getting on their horses. They're like, oh, we've got this new one for you. She's great. But don't get on her yet because we're not entirely sure what she's going to do. Like, what? (laughs) (laughs) That's a great way to start it. (laughs) A long distance ride, right? (laughs) Um, And she was a a little four-year-old off the track racing Arabian. Mm. And it had literally, I guess, just come off the track. And she was incredible. But, like, she'd never seen, like, rivers like running water like rivers before she's like the first time we had to cross a stream it's like what is this i mean the second day we rode through a river for most of the day so she kind of got over that and like she'd never been tethered before so she kept getting caught but she was really smart i think she was incredible if i could have financially justified buying her and bringing her back to canada 100 percent would have because she was just the coolest little horse i mean one of the memories there's a lot of mm-hmm. fantastic memories of that ride but a lot of it was sort of figuring out the route as we go and i have this very vivid memory of having to cross like a six lane highway because we'd slithered down the side of this <laughs> sort of sort of foothills thing outside of bursa and there was a massive highway there and we're like okay i guess we're going to cross just keep kicking hope we make it to the other side <laughs> so so there (laughs) there was that sometimes you just kick and go and try not to think about it mongolia was yeah pretty i mean it sounds cheesy to say life-changing but it was pretty life-changing because you know prior to that yes i'd crossed highways and terrorized people in olive groves but it was all relatively familiar kind of in, in the sense of what we were doing mongolia was wild i mean in the best possible way you know you got these tiny little horses They come in every shape, size, color, version you could possibly imagine. Like some look like little draft horses. Some look like little polo ponies. Some look like they were put together by a committee. Some are gated, (laughs) some aren't. And they're kind of half trained at the best of times because every Mongolian can just inherently ride. It's just what they do. And you get on and they just start galloping. Like there's no let's go for a little walk and get to know each other. It's like just get on and go. (laughs) And I remember I had a friend who came with me to Mongolia. He was the only one who really, really fit the bill. Lots of people wanted to go to Mongolia, but I'm like, you'll die. Like you're allergic to horses or you can't ride or you can't go that long without showering or any, any of these things or the food will kill you. And so the, the first day of our like, you know, multi-week trek, we get on our horses and the, the friend who had come with me, he's on this little like Palomino paint type thing. You just see this blonde streak hurtling past you across and there's no fences anywhere like it's like no way to stop them if they don't want to stop stop them (laughs) and so he goes whizzing past and our herdsman looks over and he's like can he ride like i think so i guess we'll see (laughs) and and we we named his horse dudley because he looked like a rather grumpy british explorer that's just sort of the air that this horse had about him who should be eating cucumber sandwiches he did eventually stop and and like dudley only had two speeds he was either walking really slowly like half a mile behind us and then he just take off and rip past us all and just run 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 into the distance no one else ever wanted to ride dudley but those horses i mean they'll just run and gallop and gallop for tens of kilometers every single day like they will not stop unless you make them over every sort of train you could possibly imagine. And all you can really do is you just stand up because your stirrups are always really short because they're tiny. 
So you just stand up all day long as you gallop. And Mm -hmm. when you get tired, you just lean forward and brace your hands on their neck. And that's how you rest. And you get a six pack really, really quickly. (laughs) Because you're like, wow, (laughs) I thought I was fit. Like I am ready to, at the end of our first day of riding, we must have ridden like well over 40 or 50 kilometers that day. And we get to our camp and we were staying in a gear camp. So like a tourist camp that night, it had a shower, which we appreciated. Most of the time we were in tents and got off the horses, took care of them. And I made the mistake of sitting down and I'm like, I am so physically exhausted that like I can't eat like I'm so tired that I I can do nothing and of course hospitality is huge so I felt terrible because we had this meal made for us and I was too tired to be able to digest it I'm like there's nothing wrong with it I just can't eat it I am broken I am shattered beyond all existence like the hardest thing I ever did was getting on a horse again the next day I'm like I didn't know I could <laughs> like this I've been training hard for this. I was like, good Lord, how am I going to do this? going to die. But it was incredible. It would go back there in a heartbeat. Yeah, I've ridden in Spain, um, different parts of Canada. In 2019, I was in Kyrgyzstan, which was also just mind-blowing. Because their mountains make our Rocky Mountains look like piddly little bumps in the ground. <laughs> fast, fast <laughs> mountains. Tian Shan range. And these horses would just like, boom, over glaciers, up the scree, down the scree. At one point, I'm like, oh my God, I feel terrible for my little horse. Like we're going straight up the side of this mountain. So I'm going to get off and lead him. Except you're at three and a half thousand meters. And even all the altitude medication in the world is not going to help with that. So I think I hiked, I made it for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 meters. I'm like, I got to get back on. I'm going to die. I'm going to fall off this mountain if I keep trying to lead him (laughs) up. And the horse is barely even panting. He's like, just get back on, lady. What are you doing? I was born to do this. So that kind of broke my brain in terms of, one, how much we spoil and coddle our horses in North America and like Western Europe and just what mm. they are actually capable of doing. Again, going back to the ancient world, you think of like Alexander's campaigns and the mountain ranges that he must have crossed, the passes that he must have crossed. Mm. And I don't think we often really think about the logistics of that, but they're huge. And then you realize that, yeah, these horses can do it, you know, and it's not this crazy, extraordinary thing for them. This is what they do. This is the environment they live in. So again, it, it takes it out of the books, out of the textual traditions. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, this is actually possible. They're not exaggerating or they're not glossing things over. You can do it and you still can do it. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm imagining whenever I think, and I know you've done a bunch of this writing as well. Whenever I think about the ancient world, I have to spend a good 15 minutes reminding myself no stirrups for a very long time because, you know, I, grew up in an English writing tradition. And of course we did do no stirrup work and stuff, but it was really always just as essentially a punishment. All right, you guys are not, you're not working hard enough this this class. We're, it's, everybody out of the stirrups. No, no stirrup time. November, yep, yep. Yeah, so, you know, and then it was such hard work. And then that's still in a fitted, you know, in the leather saddle with a lot more support, even an English saddle. And I know you're talking about the Mongolian, you know, stand up in your stirrups and run. And that's got to be, it's super, super hard too. But thinking about doing all of this without that sort of firmness and that that help of, and I know you've done some work on that too, right? Like you've done a bunch yeah. of bareback and also not bareback, but no stirrup riding. Yeah. I mean, certainly now, I mean, it's it's the depths of, of winter as we're recording this. So I, except when I'm at like the jumping stables where I'm doing sort of, I have you know, jumping lessons and stuff like that. And when I'm out on the, the farm with the war horses, I mean, pretty much exclusively ride bareback in the winter because it's way warmer. I mean, it is so much warmer. Mm, it's then, like, yeah. then especially if you put a blanket over you, it's like you have a little furnace under you. But yeah, I mean, didn't ride bareback a lot as a kid. We would sometimes jump on the ponies and do little vaulting lessons. You know, a lot of riding stables, like riding schools, people don't get to ride bareback, I think, because of insurance reasons. And there tends to be a sort of thought that it's not good for the horses too, which whether or not that's true, it was as wild. you say, like, yeah. Because we know the harm that ill-fitting saddles can cause. Um, so yeah, I mean, getting on bareback and being tense and bouncing around probably isn't that great for your horse, but... <laughs> you know, strip the equipment off and there's no risk of causing saddle sores or muscle atrophy or or anything like that. I think it's more just an unfamiliarity with it because when you're taught how to ride with saddle and stirrups, then that is your security. And if I haven't ridden bareback for ages, you know, the first couple of times I do, you're like, whoa, little, even on a horse I know, you're like, oh, a little precarious here. Oh, geez. Okay. (laughs) And it's always like some crazy windy day too. Like I'm going to die. This is how I'm going to (laughs) die. But one of the things you definitely start to appreciate 
when you ride bareback all the time is all of those descriptions of the ideal horse that you see in like Xenophon and Virgil and Columella, where they describe what they call the double back, which is sort of like this broad back horse with almost like a recessed spine because you don't want what we call a roached back horse where the spine kind of sticks up a little bit you can imagine why you wouldn't want that if you're riding bareback <laughs> or horses that have a giant wither like the shark fin wither which is the bump at the base of their neck yeah that also not at all pleasant when riding bareback so you start to pay attention to different aspects of horse anatomy right because it can get really uncomfortable like some horses it's like sitting on a sofa and it's magical other horses you're like Oh, why did I think this was a good idea? How quickly can this be done? I am never doing this again. So again, those subtle nuances of, yeah, we've got all of these descriptions of the ideal horse and the ancient descriptions, like the classical descriptions carry on into the middle ages and the early modern period, right? There's like this reception thing with them through different mm. equine textual traditions. But when you think about riding bareback, some of those features that we may not fixate on today make a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, I really like riding bareback. I almost prefer it to taking the stirrups off my saddle because mm. you can just sit down onto the horse. But the way you sit becomes quite different from when you have a saddle with stirrups, whether an English saddle or a Western saddle or an Aussie saddle or, or whatever. Because I mean, when you look at, I often like to use the Parthenon reliefs because they are exquisite. I mean, they're beautiful examples of sort of the ideal horse, the ideal rider, all of that. And when you look at those guys on, on their, their snorting, prancing, presumably mostly stallions, clattering through Athens in this procession, they're not in this really rigid pose, right? They're kind mm. of, they're very relaxed. Like their legs just kind of hang down. They almost have a bit of a, not a slouch, but a bit of a curve to their back because you actually have to relax down onto the horse as opposed mm. to when you're riding, you know, in a saddle where you're like, okay, I need to put my heels down. I need to do this. I need to do that so that I don't bounce out of the equipment or so that I don't get stuck in the equipment. So it's learning the subtle differences in how you sit the horse. If I get on bareback and try and sit in this very formal, almost mm -hmm. not stiff, but upright position than I would in my jumping saddle or my dressage saddle, it's going to get really exhausting and really uncomfortable very quickly. And I'm probably just going to bounce off my horse or my horse is going to get upset because I'm bouncing around. But as soon as you just relax your body, you just like sink down onto them, it becomes much easier. Yeah, I don't know. I've grown to be very fond of bareback riding. Nice to know that can be possible because yeah. yes, my memories. <laughs> I, I've never ridden bareback. I've never been on it. I don't think our stables ever would have countenanced us, even with just a rug or something. They would never have let us. So also, but I've done so much it. warmer in the winter, like so much, so much yeah. warmer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will never, ever forget riding in Ottawa winters inside, you know, unheated arena in the evenings on a yeah. January night. <laughs> With the, da the damp, <laughs> and, the cold humidity. Yeah. 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 And, in, and in natural riding boots, be, you know, later on, I started to get the sort of winterized kind of short boots and yeah. stuff. But I remember when I was younger, it was like in actual leather riding boots and just thinking, I've never been this cold and like, I, I never can't feel, feel my toes, toes again. Literally, literally <laughs> I will never feel my toes. Yeah. <laughs> toes are gone. Yeah. And where you have yeah. to like shake your feet for a good five minutes before you dared getting off the horse because you oh, couldn't yeah, feel your feet on them. how much You're going it was going to hurt. Yeah. Like, the agony of hitting oh, yeah. the ground. <laughs> and then pain. the fear of like when you start to warm up and how that's going to hurt too. <laughs> yeah. ah, good times, good times. Yeah. <laughs> the things we do, horse people are certifiably <laughs> mad. Yeah. <laughs> and like I, I paid good money and worked long hours to be able to do that. <laughs> to myself <laughs> what was really it was hilarious in mongolia because at the time so my horse back in calgary my partner rides him now was this big he's got to be like three quarters clydesdale he's massive mm. he's just this mm -hmm. huge truck of you know beast of he's delightful but he is huge and and it, it takes some oomph to get up on him and get down and mongolian horses are a good I don't know if we say Percy's probably about 17.2, 17.3 hands and Mongolian horses are probably like 12 to maybe 13 hands. So he's a good 12 or 16 inches taller than them, which may not seem like a lot until you get on the tiny horse. So the first horse I rode in Mongolia, because we did a little sort of orientation ride to go look for some wild animals. Uh, I almost vaulted over the other side when I got on. <laughs> and then when I got off, I had to grab my stirrup to stop my ass from hitting the ground. Because it was closer. <laughs> and you could just see these the, all the herdsmen, they're like, I thought you said she could ride. Like, who this is gonna be a what is, what is wrong? So then I show them a picture. I'm like, no, this is the horse I usually ride. They're like, oh, he looks like good eating. 
Because they do. He's like, he would feed a big family. So I just threatened him with that now. I'm like, if you don't go in that trailer, you would feed. I'm going to get so many complaints about this now. You would, you would feed quite a family for quite a while. They're like, he's huge. You just can't fathom a horse that big. He would last like five minutes on this step. And yeah. they couldn't possibly feed him. Yeah. No, no, no. He would go hungry very quickly. Yes. So yeah, I mean, there's been plenty of humbling moments, which I mean, horses always humble you. There's definitely been some serious humbling moments going through all of this. And showing up in, I've been, I say this touching wood because I have to go ride a horse later on today. So this could be tempting fate. But I've been pretty lucky in, in not having a lot of armor mounted combat related hospital type injuries just you know, you know brutal, brutal <laughs> so there's one time it was out at the farm and they were doing some photos and stuff and so they got me in all of the like, the plate armor the full jousting armor which i don't wear i've only worn a few times i like training the jousting horses but jousting itself i think is utterly mad and we'll do it if i have to <laughs> uh help a friend out but certainly not my go-to favorite um activity the training is actually really cool but anyway so i was in all of the armor Mm -hmm. and uh, got on the horse um, and we forgot that she was still getting used to the clattery sound of the armor it, like triggered her and so she bolts she loses it takes off and of course you all of a sudden weigh like an extra 80 or 90 pounds you're trying to and the saddles you know we <laughs> use the sort of the iberian type saddles so they've got a really high pommel and cantle to hold you in and inevitably i came off but my armor got <laughs> my leg part of my leg armor got stuck on the back of the saddle and so there was a lovely crunchy knee grinding thing that happened and I'd previously broken that knee. So I was like, damn it. So off to the ER we go. And try and explain to them. They're like, okay, so you fell off a horse. I'm like, yes, I fell off a horse. But I weighed about 90 pounds more than I usually do. And there was a trauma thing where part of me was still stuck to the horse as the horse was galloping away. And they're just like, what? Why? I don't get it. And, you know, I'm going to go see like the knee specialist, yeah. same thing. Unlike a, like, a nice cru crusader hospital or something, they don't see a lot of um, no. armor slash horseback injuries. They they don't have that one in there. No, and, I mean, I, you know, the, so it was fine. It was just sprained and whatever. And they sent me, you know, to the knee specialist at UFC. And uh, like, same thing, like <laughs> the orthopedic doctor walks in with his resident. And he just stops in the door and he stares at me on the bed. And looks at his chart and stares at me again. He's like, I've been doing this for 20 years. You are the first mounted combat injury I've had. And you're not what I expected. I did not expect to see you. I don't know what you expected. So, and, and I remember I had a horse show a couple of weeks after this at Spruce Meadows. One of their winter shows. And uh, so, of course, any horse person listening to this can relate to this because whenever you're injured, the first question you always ask is, when can I ride again? When can I get back mm -hmm. on the horse? Mm -hmm. And doctors have never figured out to tell us to wait longer than we actually need to because, you know, because you will do it sooner than yeah. they tell you. My doctor is like, oh, well, as soon as you can bend your knee again, you can get back on the horse. So, you know, I'm sitting there being like, OK, I can jam it back on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still on crutches. I like, crutch into the arena with my horse. My coach is like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, you've done this before. <laughs> like, get on. Like, I can bend my knee. I'm allowed to get back on. Yeah, and I mean, it's not like I, I don't have to walk. I mean, the right. horse, I don't even have to bend my knee once I'm in the saddle. Like, what's the problem? <laughs> For some reason, we drifted to the right a lot that day, but still. <laughs> yeah, I mean, details, details. It's Fine. Like, uh, get the it's horse fine. used to different kinds of... <laughs> Fine. And like every so often I showed up, you know, to teach like for a class or something. And I've had a black eye and people are like, oh my God. I'm like, it's fine. It's a horse. It's fine. <laughs> don't worry. You don't need to call the police. Or like, oh, I was sword fighting. <laughs> I stopped the sword with my face. It's fine. No one needs to call the police. It's okay. I'm glad you're concerned. That's good. But really, it's, it's fine. Yeah, well, and, you know, it's just another kind of experimental archaeology, right? Because we forget a lot of the time how much, you know, how many ongoing injuries, how much sort of low level basic trauma bodies were going through on a general day-to-day yep. -day experience. When you live in a culture where you have to ride horses and fight and do all of, and train to do those things, you know, nobody is walking down the street without a couple of bruises most days. <laughs> it's a different nope, kind of world. Probably not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, there know, are definitely the times where I've, where I've questioned my sanity. Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> I could be in Rome right now, but no, I am lost yeah. on the side of a mountain in an unending rainstorm somewhere in Mongolia. <laughs> I will never be warm again, never be dry again. 
have? Why am I not in Rome? So, you, I mean, you had those moments where you're like, oh, well, you know, I could have, why did I do this? Why am I doing this to myself? But at the end of the day, it's incredible and, and I wouldn't actually give it up for the world. Even if at times my body and brain question any sort of logic I might actually have. <laughs> so have you, not to be all academic about it, but have you been, I know you've been publishing stuff and articles and things. Do you have a... Am I remembering rightly that you're working on a book? So I have, I, so my PhD, my dissertation was published mm -hmm. by Ibi Taurus, now Bloomsbury, from uh, a few years ago, The Horse right. in the Ancient World, from Bucephalus to the Hippodrome. Yes. And then I did uh, a book for Casemate on sort of ancient Greek warfare, hoplites to heroes. And then I have some projects I'm working on right now. Some of them I am making my venture into things related to gender, which was not anything I'd ever really worked on before. So I'm looking at the presence of females, both human and equine, in in ancient athletics and ancient equestrian competition. So I have a chapter mm. in just revising mm. for a, an edited volume on horses on that. And there's certainly some of the things I'd like to explore with that. The sports are something I've become really fascinated with, sort of the idea of horse sports and how they connect to cultural traditions and how they get incorporated into cultural traditions. So that is actually something that a book I would like to, to work on. I, whenever I get a chance to do that, because I have to finish <laughs> some other stuff first. But kind of looking at the role of not just the major sports, like the circus and, you know, the Panhellenic Games, but even kind of local, regional, sort of ethnic type sports, equestrian sports, mm. because there are some really interesting ones. Like they seem to have the precursor to steer wrestling, where they jump oh. off their horses and wrestle steers to the ground. It's on their coins. There's a whole thing. And it was part of a, probably a festival to Poseidon. So in other parts of, again, the ancient world, you get these really interesting, almost like niche local horse sports that I'd, I'd like to do some investigating with. I published a little bit on it. There's a, a Turkish game where you throw javelins. I mean, they're blunted javelins, but you throw javelins at each other on horseback. And we know it dates back to at least the Ottoman period, but it is kind of reminiscent to things that are described in like the ancient Roman Hippica Gymnasia and the Troy games and stuff like that. Uh, and then in Central Asia, they play this game that I'm mildly obsessed with called Buzkashi, which is goat polo. So it's kind of like this <laughs> an absolutely insane version of polo slash rugby slash hockey. I don't even know. But anyways, played on horseback. It, you play it with a goat carcass or a calf carcass. So again, I'm probably going to get all sorts of complaints from the animal welfare people about <laughs> this. Um, but they do sometimes use a synthetic one now because they have international tournaments. And so they are starting to use a synthetic carcass for the international tournaments because it's a little more <laughs> palatable. But it's just this mad game. We know that it's, it's at least hundreds of years old. Again, where it actually originates from because so much of Central Asia is, is oral traditions. Mm -hmm. Some tie it back to the Mongols, some take it back further, but it's utterly mad. They charge, I mean, now it's a team game. It didn't used to be. It used to be an individual game. So it was every every rider, every chap and does for, for himself trying to get this goat. Because the game means the name means steal the goat. So trying to get this goat carcass away from like a hundred <laughs> other tribesmen who are all charging after you, beating you with a whip, trying to yank this carcass back. And, and you're just... <laughs> You know, we have these accounts from, you know, Europeans who were traveling down into Afghanistan and areas like that. And they're watching these matches and they're like, because there was, there were no arenas at the time. So they're like jumping hedges, going through irrigation ditches, swimming across ponds, trying to get away from everyone with this goat <laughs> carcass. Because to win, you have to drop it free and clear of anyone else. So no one could be near you when you were doing it, which obviously is really hard to judge. And uh, spectators risked getting trampled on a regular basis. I mean, I've watched watched Buzkashi in Kyrgyzstan. I'm kind of the informal, you know, out in the hills version. And we did have to bolt out of the way many, many times as the clutch of horses and the goat charged towards you at a high rate of speed. So that, again, yes, yeah, just fascinated by these games and kind of the importance they hold within communities and cultures. And then, and then I'm working on some of the usual stuff, looking at Macedonian cavalry and Macedonian horse cultures and stuff like sort of the idea of a Macedonian horse culture as well. So yeah, horses everywhere. <laughs> Your mention of gender reminded me of uh, a, st a story that I've heard, and I don't know, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but that during the Crusades, the Europeans, you know, came with their stallions, but their Islamic foes would always ride mares and chaos would ensue. Is that, what would that have been like? So, I mean, I think I, I am learning that this is probably more of an apocryphal tale. I have a, a friend mm. who's doing her PhD at Leiden in Arabic history, Arabic studies, and she bred Arab horses in Egypt for 10 years. And so mm. she is actually doing an amazing job of myth busting a lot of the 
mm-hmm. Western sort of orientalized traditions we have, especially about the Arabian horse, like sort of the romanticization of the Arabian horse. And so, yes, there are these mm-hmm. stories about the preference for mares and People say that it goes back to a story about the Prophet Muhammad and, and the Alhamsa, his five mares, who, uh, you know, he'd finished a, a campaign and right across the desert and they get to this oasis and he lets his horses go and they all run to the water and he blows the battle trumpet to see who's loyal and these five mares come back and the rest don't. So, but the origins of this story are possibly more recent than maybe, but anyways. So whether they were actually all on mares or not, that is probably a bit apocryphal, but the description of sort of what happens where these stallions do basically lose their minds. I mean, that is entirely possible. Stallions can work very well together. You can, you know, they you can, they can socialize with one another. But they're, obviously, when you bring mares into the picture, especially if any of those mares are in season, so receptive to breeding, they're going to smell those pheromones. And that's potentially going to cause some issues on the crusader <laughs> side of things, because the stallions are going to be all of a sudden more focused on a different job, not the go to war job, but the I need to to mm-hmm. breed and reproduce and there's potential rivals all around me but yeah i know i love that story i really wanted it to be a real story for a long time i thought it was a real story but now i'm being forced to question that it does it does a little too neatly fit yeah. into the masculinization gender. feminization mm-hmm. of different cultures and yeah. you know it, it does fit a little bit too well into that and anytime Anytime a story fits those narratives too well. So nicely. Or yeah, you've got like the, you know, (laughs) the Europeans on their mighty stallions and then, and then the other side on their mares and there's no geldings Mm. anywhere. I mean, we know, I think it's Strabo says that the Scythians gelded their horses. So castrated Mm. the the male horses. And that actually does seem to be true because when you look at, again, you know, places like, I know I refer to Mongolia a lot, but it really is kind of the closest we can get to... A society of, that still has working horses. Yeah, it still has a working horse way, yeah. nomadic culture where horses are just mm-hmm. turned loose on the step. Even, you know, even now, really the only form of controlled breeding they do is castrating most of the male horses. So they keep some as, as stallions and just turn them loose and the rest are geldings. So mm-hmm. again, just for, from the horse management perspective and the husbandry perspective, that Strabo's comment does make sense that they probably would have gelded most of their horses because it was just mm-hmm. an easier way of... Like, well, and you don't really want to have her dominance battles going on all the time because you're going to get your horses hurt and stuff like that it just it's not useful yeah yeah if if you're not controlling them and separating them and things yeah so So, yeah but yes gender (laughs) and horses it is it is a thing for sure there's a lot of loaded gender references and allusions and uh, definitely that exists in the ancient literature as well right references to mares and, and fillies and the sort of sexual innuendos and ideas that go along with that yeah it's lot. very hard not to think of the horace poem about uh, and other you know depictions of girls as unbroken fillies yeah. Or, you know, with their golden spurs and sort of like Aphrodite's mm-hmm. jockey sort of idea. I mean, there's tons mm-hmm. of sexual references mm-hmm. going on there that come back to the, to, to the horse and gender and the idea mm-hmm. of taming something, breaking something, controlling it, dominance. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is certainly all in there. And it's not something that I've worked on a lot. I could see working on it because, again, it's just another rabbit hole to fall into because mm-hmm. horses are <laughs> everywhere. It might be. I don't know if this is the way you'd think about it, but it's also might be interesting to look at the sort of gender stereotypes of horses in the ancient world and the modern world, because there's a lot of that now, right? Like what mares are good for, what stallions are good for, what geldings are good for, what, in what particular, there's so much like mares are tricky and mares are, you know, there's like weird stereotyping mm-hmm. that, that matches sort of up with the human stereotyping of gender, but doesn't completely in mm-hmm. these odd ways. And I and I don't know anything about how those match up with, you know, are those continuities from the ancient world or are they different? Do they have to do, do they change as the human stereotypes of gender change? Yeah, I mean, I always wonder about the stallion thing. I mean, we have really sort of skewed perceptions of stallions, I think, particularly, you know, in places like Canada and, and, and the US and, and Western Europe, because we had to create this idea that stallions are dangerous and can be violent, they need to be... And they're apart. exceptional. Yeah, yeah and they're, the they, sh- they should be, yeah, if you're not going to breed them, you should probably castrate them. You shouldn't breed every stallion or every mare for good reason. You want to pass on, you know, overpopulation is an issue. You want to pass on good traits, be breeding them for a purpose, because there are so many horses that end up, you know, in the slaughter chain because no one's using them and, and they're not, and, they're uh, not useful know, enough or they're not useful part. enough or over again overpopulation and things like that and so this idea that you know stallions are so difficult to keep and and again because you look back to the european 
especially the European tradition, whether we're looking at the classical world or the medieval world, and this whole idea of the stallion, right? And the warrior or the aristocrat or the elite, the prince, the dauphin, you know, on a stallion. And this notion of the control and the power and the... the I mean, stallions do, they do build up more. They develop more muscle because of their hormones and stuff like that. So they do tend to look more physically Im imposing than a mare or a horse that was gelded quite young. So I think it, the stallion somehow gets tied into these notions of masculinity and this mm -hmm. idea that it can be so dangerous. And, you know, people even say things like, oh, you know, women shouldn't handle stallions because, you know, the stallion will smell if she's having her time of the month and it'll get, I mean, it's ridiculous. There is, this is absolutely insane. But this notion that, yeah, care less, but I <laughs> that women shouldn't women's be handlers of, of stallions because they're not strong. You know, stallions are too big and strong and this and that. And it, so we've actually like, painted the stallion and we've started to make them antisocial and dangerous because we're denying them their hoarseness. We come up with these ideas that they need to be, you know, they can't be pastured near another horse. They can't go out with another horse. They need to be in this stall away from everyone else with super high walls. We basically put them in solitary confinement. It's a social animal. Of course, it's going to lose their mind. But then you look at other situations where, like the Spanish school in Vienna, they only use stallions for their stuff, like the Lipizzaners. They're all stallions. They're all stapled next to each other. They all travel together. They all work together. They all look perfectly fine like they're not trying to kill each other they're not trying they're all very well mannered they're well socialized you know in kyrgyzstan we all rode stallions and you know you would just hobble them at night and turn them out in the field and every so often there'd be a squeal or whatever but they weren't trying to murder each other all of the time so again we create these gendered expectations you know stallions are super massive and strong and powerful mm -hmm. and dangerous and we turn the animal into that because of how we treat it so that's kind of uh it's not necessarily that i mean yes mm -hmm stallions when there are breeding mares around are going to maybe be a little more aware of things and you know don't be lax or casual around them but they're not all trying to they're not like bucephalus the horse eating beast from the alexander romance or the human eating beast from the alexander romance they're just horses right so we, we turn them into something else <laughs> and, the, and the same thing with the idea of the mare right like you know the big thing now for a while has been the chestnut mare right the red-headed mare and this has to go back a while because even going back to like the the novel black beauty in, in the 1800s right i mean ginger the mare who is the antithesis of the ideal female in every way i mean she is very intentionally a red-headed female horse and even now it's really hard to sell them right people do not want to buy ginger mares because there's this prejudice against mm -hmm. them because somewhere some story arose about them being more sensitive than others and it's perpetuated and again probably affects how we treat those animals because we assume it's a chestnut mare it's going to be you know obnoxious or super sensitive or try and kill me so i'm going to treat it differently and we have to be preemptively yeah. controlling yeah yeah which then because they're so sensitive, yeah, well that, i mean that brings up the sorry go ahead. i was gonna say because they're so sensitive to our body language as prey animals we may not even realize that we're basically reinforcing the stereotypes Right. We are reinforcing the stereotypes about stallions, about geldings, about mares all the time, about ponies. Right. You know, ponies being little devils. I mean, some of them are. Some of them are really nice. It just depends how they were trained, like with any animal. And so we reinforce this, but it kind of has further reaching consequences. Mm -hmm. And beyond, beyond gender, too, of course, that like <laughs> if horses had races, horse people would be such racists because the number of times I've heard people say, oh, well, you know, it's an Appaloosa, so it's this, or she's, oh, well, yeah, or as you say, like a chestnut. Well, you know what chestnuts are like. Like every coat color seems to have a temperament that goes with it and a, yeah. a flaw that goes with it. And, you know, I mean, I realize that some of them are tied to breeds or types, so there are going to be you know, certain characteristics that are more likely in certain colorations, but as if like every yeah. chestnut horse of every breed has Dude. some tie that's always the same. And, and, you know, you can say it about horses because they're just horses, but, <laughs> but, really, but no, it is true. the kind of thinking that really reveals a lot about the way people want to categorize the world. Well, and even going back to the, I mean, going back to the ancient world, because that's theoretically what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Detailed you know, details. you do, again, get get in some of the texts, you know, you do get these references to, to different types of horses, breeds, if you want to call them that. I don't call them that, but these types. And having different characteristics and traits and skill sets associated with them, right? So again, the idea that, oh, the, the you know, Thessalian horse is incredible and says preeminent, wonderful, you know, highly sought after animal or the Nisaean horse or, you know, I think it's Arian in his text on hunting 
scene, he's talking about different types of horses you could use for hunting. He says, you know, like the Scythian horse, it's not pretty. Like, it's not a beautiful looking animal. It's, you know, not this aesthetically gorgeous thing. You're not going to ride in the procession, but it'll run forever, right? So when you're chasing that stag, when you're hunting that animal, you know, the other horses, the fancier horses will start to lag far sooner, but this sort of not the most attractive kind of, you know, run of the mill sort of horse will just keep going. The one that's not really fancy, that isn't highly bred, that isn't spoiled and kept in stables, it'll just keep going. So the, again, this idea of certain ideas or attitudes towards towards different types of horses. Horses. I mean, it is there. It's not, I suppose, I don't want to say it's quite as prevalent as in the modern world, but it's there, right? This idea of preference. Mm-hmm. And, and even going into the Middle Ages again, you know, you get to good old Henry VIII and, you know, he wanted to, you know, breed bigger horses, which makes sense. It's Henry VIII. He was not a tiny person. And so the idea <laughs> of like native British breeds like the Welsh ponies, you know, basically trying to almost like eradicate those or not, not promote those breeds because he wanted to breed bigger horses. And you get this in other parts as well. We want to improve the local horses. So bringing other stuff in to try and make them bigger or flashier or something. And that all comes back to us and the status and the hierarchies that we attach to this and, you know, who's on the the purebred thoroughbred horse or warm blood versus maybe the, the cob or the pony or things like that. So there are these inherent prejudices that definitely persist in the horse rule that aren't just a product of the 20th or 21st century. They have been around for a very long time. And and if you look, you can find it in the ancient literary traditions as well. That makes me think of the origins of the word race, right? Yes. We were discussing that. Which its earliest uses seem to all be connected with horse breeding. Mm -hmm. In English. In English and Romance languages. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that wouldn't surprise me because it's such a status animal. I mean, it's always been such a status animal and mm-hmm. and the idea and also because it is used for a number of different functions yeah. you get that functional breeding you know where you want your draft horses and you want your riding horses and you want so that which we do in all of our domesticated species plant animal everything yeah. obviously we do it we've been doing it for forever but it's not at all surprising that it would it would have that that there's a sort of a science to it that there yeah. becomes this yes this. science in very big quotation marks yeah there's a lot of uncomfortable connections i think between breeding animals and things like eugenics i mean we can't really deny that like it's there and trying to breed the perfect horse and trying to breed you know the perfect representation the fastest horse the, the best jumper the strongest horse often you know again it gets to the point where you then start doing what they call line breeding which is basically inbreeding because you're trying to create perfection and as we've also seen with so many dog breeds, it comes at the expense of the actual animal itself because you're trying to exaggerate certain features or promote certain features or fit a stereotype that the public has created or that the audience has created about this type of horse or this type of dog. And you end up breeding for appearance or for a particular thing like speed or jumping ability. And to, the, to the detriment of, of overall health and yeah. things, yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. which is one thing I think, going back to the ancient world, that is one thing that we don't see as much of, is this idea of Mm. specialized breeding. I mean, as you move into the sort of Roman Empire, and and we know that there are kind of studs, stud farms and stuff around the empire, breeding like circus horses and, you know, horses for the racetrack and stuff like that. But even then, it's not this sort of specialized breeding that's appeared kind of in the last two to three hundred years, where you start breeding those Mm. big draft horses, and you start breeding horses specifically for running, and you start breeding horses specifically for hunting and, and, and things like that. With this quarter diversity. mile versus a two miler yeah yeah <laughs> like really it, you know when when yeah. we when we look back to the ancient world there were some regions that were more renowned for their horses than others and those horses were more highly um sought after but you don't seem to get suggestions of trying to improve breeds or create new breeds it's more like this idea of well this is the type of horse that's really well suited to this environment that i live in and so i'm gonna get the best version of that because why would i import something from somewhere else and alter what nature created to then create a horse that maybe it's bigger or prancier or a different color but is more likely to break down because again, horses, even for elites, are expensive. Mm-hmm. So you you want something that's going to be able to do the job that you have bred or purchased it for. I think that would be really interesting if, I mean, I know you have a million threads that you're going to be following <laughs> and that you do not need more research subjects. But it would be very interesting, and since it's such a topical thing in the world of classics right now, to think about, and you may well have done so, the you know the theories of race in the ancient world. Yeah. And how that is relative, because what you're talking about is the environmental determinism of which was, you know, such a fundamental theory 
of racial characteristics and you know, human difference when you look at ethnography. And that what you're suggesting essentially is that it makes total sense, of course, that it also was true of the way they thought about horses, that if you wanted a different horse, you needed a horse from a different place because that place would have created a horse of a certain kind. Not that what you do is you breed them for traits. I mean, you don't need to know genetics to be able to do that, but it's a different, that idea of inheritability of characteristics, irrespective of environment, is not really the kind of thinking that we see in the way race or type is characterized in the ancient world. Like it wouldn't make sense. The idea that we see elsewhere, which is if you take people out of an environment and you leave them in another place for a while, they'll start to take on the characteristics of the new environment. That's not that idea that they'll breed true. <laughs> if you yeah. think of it, sorry. There's no good terminology in any of this, especially if you apply it to humans. There's no good way of saying. But that idea doesn't, you know, it's a very different fundamental idea about how characteristics are, are created. So that makes sense that that would be how they would think of the animals. Well, and it's really, I joined a, a workshop a, a, a month or so ago that was looking at sort of it was an equine history workshop and it was again looking at ideas of breeding and, and shaping the horse's body and stuff over different periods of time but you know someone had mentioned it I'd never thought of it before but really when when we talk about breeding animals in English by and large the language that we use to describe the breeding of animals is we're, we're using human language we're using words that mm-hmm. we use to dis- discuss human acts of reproduction we don't have necessarily specific terminology that's for different species of animals so we kind of anthropomorphize the whole process which again plays mm-hmm. into this notion of race and the issues that come along with that because again we're looking at it very much from a human lens and a human perspective um, rather than the, the perspective of nature and that particular species and the factors that might sort of influence their reproductive process and mating process and things mm-hmm. like that. So I'd never really thought about how language can inform the way we view breeding and the way we view the creation or alteration of other species, which is often done at our behest mm-hmm. because it's that whole species is anthropocentric thing of we control what we want to create. Which always, and that's where, you know, looking back to Central Asia, yes, the form of control they have is is gelding. And I'm sure they do, you know, breed specific stallions to specific mares for their race horses. But other than that, they really do just leave it to let nature do its thing. And you do get all of these unexpected colors. You get pintos and, and spotted horses and palominos and like color combinations I'd never really seen before. And it just happens mm. naturally. They're not necessarily breeding for a color. It's just genetics doing its thing in a somewhat uncontrolled environment. And where they're not even doing very much to, I mean, if they aren't doing things like culling herds, though, I suppose if they're eating them, they they are occasionally making choices, you know, so there's a little bit of artificial selection going on where they're like, well, that's the one that we'll eat because that's the one that like threw five people yesterday. (laughs) That one's going in the pot. (laughs) But otherwise, yeah, there's not a lot of the kind of artificial selection that goes on even with cattle or sheep or things like that on a farm usually. Yeah. So when I was there, which was in 2008, talking to some of the, so the Nottam festival is their big festival where they have the, the, the horse races and their horse races are like 15 to 30 ish kilometers long. We're not talking like a mile on a Kentucky Derby track and they're just across the step. It's utterly mad. Jockeys are all children. Saddles are optional. Shoes are optional. You just, you just go. <laughs> and sometimes the kids are still hanging on at the end. Sometimes they aren't. And, and, you know, the, the Russian Jeep goes back to find them. But that's what you do. But there was this concern that they, you know, some people were starting to import larger horses from Russia and cross them with the Mongolian horses to try and make them bigger. And that's almost this this Western sizes notion, because we are very sizes about our horses. We tend to look down upon small I mean, aside from some disciplines, tend to look down upon small horses. We think bigger is better, much like with our houses and our cars and all of that, right? And again, that can be to the detriment of the horse, especially for certain jobs. And so there was this very real concern about what was going to happen to the Mongolian horse and, you know, the hardiness and durability and endurance and stuff that it was so famous for when you started bringing in these these outside types and crossbreeding to basically try and create something new. And is that going to ch- change how these races mm-hmm. function and how long they are and the type, the, the temperament of the horse and the way that they're able to keep these horses? You know, are they going to have to alter essentially their husbandry traditions to fit this new bigger horse that some people with the, the wealth and the resources and means to import them are starting to do. And what's that going to do to the kind of the, the playing field? So it is a very real mm-hmm. sort of concern. 
Yeah, yeah, I can see that. And yeah, because if you can't afford to feed them, then you can't afford to have them. And then do you have to change? If they're not hardy mm-hmm. enough to survive it on the step, then okay, do you need stables? And what does that mean for nomadism? Because you're just going to build stables wherever you go, or are you going to keep this horse in one particular spot and then have the other horses somewhere else? And, and it just becomes more complicated and more stratified. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, I think probably we should stop there. Though we I mean, rambled on all over topics the we can talk about <laughs> over the place for a while. Oh no, that's we are big fans of all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the thing about this topic is, uh, you know, like, and I love it. Like, I certainly don't want people to not do this. It's it's one of my favorite things. Is I will literally get questions on anything about anything to do with horses from the mm-hmm. earliest ancestor of the horse 55 million years ago to like <laughs> the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. People are like horses, you must know everything about horses. So, so <laughs> I do, I all of a sudden you're reading things on genetics and, and this and that and mm-hmm. metaphors and breeding and like, okay, I could have just. Oh yeah. We didn't touch. We didn't even touch on <laughs> hardly touched on art. We didn't touch <laughs> on religion and horses. Mm-hmm. No. We didn't talk. <laughs> Kind of like, we didn't talk about horses as draft animals. We didn't, talk, and the lack I mean, thereof. We didn't talk. You know, when I was stuff we didn't talk when I was like when I was still in the job market, and you know, you'd see all the paucity of jobs that would come out. But you know, looking for mm-hmm. oh, someone that does you know can talk about Near Eastern stuff or this or that. I'm like, well, I can because I've had to learn as long as there's a horse involved, I can like, talk about anything. If it's the ancient world, and they had horses. I had to learn about it because I had to talk about the horses and I had to understand the culture. <laughs> but you can just see that like there's no no. No, you, you can't possibly. They had horses. They have horses. I can tell you something about them. And horses were everywhere. So they have both literally and metaphorically taken me some very interesting places. For sure. <laughs> what more can you ask from a research subject, right? It's true. Someone but... said to me, you were like living every six-year-old girl's dream. And I'm like, it is true. And I do need to kind of remind myself about when I'm like, oh, I'm drowning in marking. And I'm stressed about this chapter that's overdue. And blah, blah, blah. It's like, right. But I can just... Like, okay, well, I'm going to go jump on a horse and fire a bow and and I'm still technically working, but also having a ridiculous amount of fun while doing it. Yeah. Yeah. See, we didn't even talk about archery, but we'll, <laughs> another time. We'll do it another time. <laughs> we should open that barn door another time. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Quick, somebody go get the horse and bring it back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating and fun and I knew it would be and it was. It was well, absolutely as we knew it would be. <laughs> I like the kind of like, we'll and, see where uh, it goes. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I, I don't think we'll have any trouble filling the time. No. <laughs> so I will make sure that I put your books in our show notes, but say the titles again, just one more time. Like, uh, uh, so The Horse in the Ancient World from Bucephalus Hippodrome, which was Ivy Taurus, is now Bloomsbury. And then Greek Warriors, Hoplites to Heroes, which is Casemate. And then I have various and sundry chapters. Other things. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But, but if people are interested in finding out more, Horse in the Ancient World would probably be a good start. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a good start. Yeah. So, yeah. So thanks very much. Thank you. This has been, yeah, a blast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's so much fun to do. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.